Okay, so somebody would like to share what happened in the meditation. I see Lakshmi is back with us, so I'm going to start with her. Hello. Yes. Um, um, there were mm, some a little pressure on my breast, um, but uh, as well silence and some thoughts about the guest house. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Our, our last booking <laughs> at, okay. at uh, dinner, but um, as well a silence, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so um, somebody else, like, ah, oh, Peter would like to share. Go ahead. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Nice to meet you. Hello. Yeah, at first. Uh, uh, just just wait one minute. Om, can you arrange that I can see Peter big on the screen? Because I don't only see myself. Yeah, just something I'm not so interested to look at myself, of course. Or side by side could also be nice. Peter, can you say something? Yes, yes, okay. And there is there. It's, um, it was at first here before my chest. Okay. A very intense field, which gets bigger and bigger. Good. And in the middle of the meditation, I felt something from, from the outside, from the group, just like connectedness. Right. Uh, it was very nice. Thank you. Okay. Is it your first Zoom meeting? Did I meet you before? It's the first meeting with you and that group. Okay. Good. Good. Well, you're clearly very sensitive then. That's nice. <laughs> okay. Somebody else like to offer to share? Pad Padma then. Um, yeah, I actually also felt something like pressure in my chest and, um, but it was not like hurting. It was just, uh, like the, the energy main point was here in the chest area and I could really think in it and also was, uh, kind of quiet in my mind. It was, yeah, very nice. Good, yeah. All right, somebody else like to wave their hand, share what happened? <clears throat> okay, so then uh, Rajan, would you like to share? Um. Yeah, um, just felt to relaxation. Yeah. Okay. So was it quiet or was there some thoughts? Yeah, some thoughts, but mostly quiet also. And um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's been a long time, so it's nice to, to have this satsang again. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. We have a few technical issues tonight, but basically it's nice to see everybody on the screen. <laughs> and now Patrick uh, likes to share. Yes, uh, there was a part, a uh, part of me who couldn't stand the silence. And I didn't really have to change it. But I just looked at it. So what what hap what happens now? That yeah was quite an interesting perception. Right, right. And um, 
<clears throat> you get some sense about why you couldn't accept the silence? Mm, that's the point where um, I realized my mind tried to um, escape somehow. It, every every time I wanted to touch it, um, you know, it 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 tried to escape this um, this que this question. Yes. Okay. Well, let's see. I think we didn't meet before on Zoom, so maybe during the the meeting you will let uh, some people change. So nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet you too. Okay, somebody else likes to offer themselves. <clears throat> okay, then I'd like to invite Hannah Mann, who's from Ukraine. So we haven't had any contact, much contact for several months. So we're pleased you're still alive, Hannah Mann. You've got your camouflage uh, shirt on tonight. Hi, John David. Hi to everyone. We are alive and we are continuing. Right, right. And tonight you have power, it seems, or is it on the generator? И кажется, что сегодня у вас есть энергия, или вы на генераторе? Да, мы на генераторе, сейчас на генераторе работаем. Есть свет, есть тепло, ну, с интернетом, вот здесь интернет. В акте сейчас с детьми в другом корпусе, и там плохая связь. Она не смогла uh, we, соединиться. We are using generator now, so we have electricity and heating and internet here, but back to in some other room with the kids and her connection is not so good. Okay. And how, how are the kids? Like how are the kids? The kids are in order. Now it's cold, a little bit like that. A little bit like that, but it's like seasonal things. Kids are well in general. Now it's getting colder, and they had like a season cold, but in general, well. And how many hours a day are you without power? Сколько часов в день нету электричества? Сутки сейчас у нас есть более-менее точный график двенадцать часов. Каждые четыре часа выключают электричество на четыре часа. Четыре есть, четыре выключают. In average, like a half day, but it's more or less on schedule. So for four hours we have electricity, and then it's four hours cut. Okay, and that that big power station nearby. Is it still functioning? Ah, вот эта большая электростанция рядом с вами, она работает? Да, она работает. Там сейчас поставили вот эти военную технику ПВО. К нам иногда приходят ребята, ну, мужчина и женщина, они оттуда из штаба, ну. Как гости, так иногда снимают у нас жилье. Мы подружились, и они хотят прийти на крещение, штаб привести в проруби в реке, хотят купаться в в ледяной воде. Сказали, можете вы это сделать? Сказали, да, мы можем покрестить, провести обряды, покормить. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this power station is working, and now there are some militaries around protecting this power station. And we have a guest from these militaries, like a couple, and they've been asking if uh, they can come. There will be like a holiday soon, 
when people yeah. usually like go into the water into into the cold water it's some christian holiday soon will okay. be happening like in next week and they've been asking if they can do it with the whole military squad to come to <laughs> our place and make this kind of uh, swimming there okay well, yeah and hanuman told us that uh, they're happy to to invite them to come for a swim on this holiday in their place okay okay let them leave their bomb somewhere else а пусть только где-то бомбы оставят где-то в другом месте. Для новой картины Джон Дэвид, да? You have a new painting, Джон Дэвид, I can see. Yes, we we opened a new exhibition two weeks ago. Мы открыли новую выставку две недели назад. And uh, it was perhaps our most successful exhibition, I think, in the last 15 years. Это, наверное, была одна из самых успешных выставок за 15 лет. Yeah. Они хорошо отражают настроение Ханумана сейчас. They represent very well the Hanuman um, feelings right now, or mood. Okay. Mood, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Mm. But actually, you, you look very good. I'm very happy to see you. Но ты выглядишь очень здорово, и очень рад тебя видеть. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank maybe, you. maybe you heard that today there was a big victory in the south of Ukraine. И может быть ты слышал, что сегодня была большая победа на юге Украины. Did you hear about Kherson? Ты слышал про Херсон? Я сейчас не смотрю новости, я не слышу звуки. Uh, mm. сигнал тревог и когда ракеты тоже летают я тоже не слышу mm. нет I, I, I'm not following news that much now and but but I also I can I don't hear the rockets and bombs so I'm, I'm pretty happy now okay good good okay so uh, maybe one more person <clears throat> Somebody like, oh, I know who, where is she gone? Ah, oh, she's gone, Cecilia. Are you hearing this, Cecilia? No, she's, she's offline, I think. Okay, oh, there she is. Cecilia, would you like to come through? So Cecilia is from Panama. Do you speak oh, yeah. English? English. Um, a little, <laughs> not a too little. much. Okay, well, we have we have a, a Spanish translator. Tenemos so, autor al español. So go ahead in Spanish. Pues nice en to español. meet you. Más cómodo. Encantado de conocerte. <laughs> Igualmente, estoy muy feliz de estar aquí con, con, con John David eh, y ustedes. Estoy feliz, pero no sabes cuánto. Nice to meet you. I'm very happy of being here with you. Good, good. <laughs> and you have a, a wonderful story that I think your father met Papaji. Yes. Tienes una sí. historia maravillosa. Tu padre conoció a Papaji. Sí, sí. And en, uh, yeah. what do you know? What year he was there? Was he there in Lucknow? What what year he was there? Sabes en qué año I... él estuvo allí en Lucknow? I was born, uh, I come from Venezuela, and okay. now I'm living in Panama, but uh, okay. this story uh, happened when I was uh, in Venezuela. Right. Right. And did Papaji come to Venezuela? Yes, in to maybe around, uh, but, pardon, eh, uh, alrededor de 1976. Yes, in uh, 1976. Wow, wow. Okay, yes. I, met, I met him in uh, 1992. Yo le conocí so, en 1992. So, mm. 20, 20 years later. Okay. Eh, casi 20 años después. 
And at that time, there was quite a big community around him living in Lucknow in the north of India. In aquella época, había una comunidad muy grande alrededor de él viviendo en Lucknow, en el norte de la India. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I stayed there for nearly five years. Estuve allí por cerca de cinco años. And uh, actually, I interviewed many of the people who visited Papaji. Y realmente he entrevistado a muchas de las personas que han conocido a Papaji. And, and our, our first book, because uh, we have a publishing company and we published altogether about 30 books. And the first one was called Papaji Amazing Grace. Yes. Eh, tenemos una editorial de libros y el primer, hemos editado como unos 30 libros, pero el primero lo llamamos Papaji Amazing Grace. Right. Mm -hmm. And at the ah. moment, I, at the moment, I'm working on a new book called Day by Day with Papaji. Y ahora estoy trabajando en un nuevo libro que se llama Día a Día con Papaji. Right. So maybe a little bit later we'll try to have a conversation because I think you have a wonderful story to share. Um, yeah. después podemos tener una conversación porque creo que tienes una maravillosa historia por compartir. Yes. Yes. Ves, muy importante, una historia muy bonita y es cuando yo recibí la luz en mil 1986. Después. It, it is a de very, yeah, it is a very beautiful story, very important about when I got. It was when I got the light in, uh, uh, in 1986. Okay. 19, 1986. 1986. Right, right. Because. Wow. <clears throat> yes. Because, okay, yo era muy pequeña cuando mi papá conoció a, a Papaji. I was very young when my dad met Papaji. So, right. Mi papá recibió la, la luz, pero años después se puso a conversar conmigo y a mí me, me, me recibí la luz de Papaji en ese And momento. My dad got the, the light. And years later, uh, talking to my dad, I got also the light from my dad, from Papa. Right, yes. right. Okay, so well, we'll, we'll arrange a meeting and you can tell me your story and maybe I can put it into the new book. Ahora. Sí, podemos acordar una reunión para que me cuentes de la historia y quizá la podemos incluir en el libro. So the, the new book is people telling me, you know, how they met Papaji, what happened when they met him, and telling, you know, some stories about Papaji's life and so on. So your story will be perfect for that book. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. And okay. Now, well, welcome. Would I'm you like... I just released a little headache that I had when we start the, the, the meditation. Now I right. want to share it. All. Good. Go thank ahead. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. You okay? You want to share what happened or? Quieres compartir lo que pasó en la meditación? Um, cuando la meditación empezó. Eh, yo tenía desde ayer un fuerte dolor de cabeza porque eh, que yo traigo de por una situación um, que estoy trabajando ahora eh, y durante la meditación ahora acabo de darme cuenta que se fue se, se quitó el dolor de cabeza que tenía varios varios días tenía como dos de, dos semanas con este problema uh, before I had a very strong headache uh, because of certain situation, a certain problem, but uh, during the meditation, this headache uh, disappeared. I have realized okay. that. Uh, yes. That right. Right. So. It's, it's very interesting how 
this Zoom meeting has a kind of power in it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so very nice to meet you. Encantado de conocerte. Okay, so... Um, Muchas gracias. See. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think I'm going to talk a bit because uh, maybe you know this, but at the moment in Egypt, there is a big conference about the state of the planet and what we human beings are doing to the planet. And uh, recently I came across a man called Peter Beard, Peter Beard. Okay, so this is a photograph when he was younger and he is an amazing person because he came in a, from a, a rich American family and he went to Yale University, so he was very well educated. <clears throat> and in the, in the 50s, in the 1950s, he was very attracted to go to Africa. He was already a photographer and he had a strong feeling about animals. And so he went to Africa, he landed in Kenya, in um, the capital of Kenya. Uh, I've forgotten the name, of course. What's the name? Somebody tell me the name. Nairobi, Nairobi, Nairobi. Okay, so he arrived in Nairobi. And in the 1950s, Nairobi was quite a small little town. And the country was a huge country. And already since many thousands of years, the animals had been living completely naturally, traveling through that country knowing you know when to go to which part of the country um you know to get water to get food and so on there was thousands of years of natural uh, stability of the of the animals and of course uh, in the 1950s there was a population of only five million people in kenya five million people and uh, probably there were more elephants actually than people because there were huge, huge herds of elephants. I'm going to show you one of his amazing photographs. You can hardly believe it. I don't know if you can see it even, but I try to show you. You see this enormous herd of elephants. So this was he, a photo he took in the 1950s, and this was the um, almost the last time that uh, the animals could be in such vast numbers. Already, maybe 50 years before, Western people, maybe rich people, had come to Africa and gone shooting, gone hunting, and they would kill, you know, rhinoceroses, they'd kill elephants, lions, all the, the um, all these wonderful animals, they would shoot them like we might shoot rabbits. Because in those days, there was a tremendous bounty of natural, um, the, na the nature of, uh, of animals. And he was very touched from what he found in Africa. So I don't remember exactly the times, but anyway, he bought uh, some land outside of Nairobi and he lived there very simply. He made a kind of camp, tent camp with a campfire. He called it Hog Ranch, Hog Ranch. And he would travel between New York and Kenya over the next 50 years. And uh, you might be interested to know that now the population of Kenya, 70 years later, 
is 54 million. So in his day, there were 5 million human beings, and now there are 54 million human beings. And of course, during the years he was living there, the number of human beings was gradually increasing. And so there was increasing pressure on the animals. So when they would had enormous areas to, um, to live their life, gradually this was getting more and more restricted. And I think in the 60s, the government decided to have a new policy and they created uh, some kind of animal, uh, I don't know what, you, what they call it, but anyway, there were certain areas which they set aside for the animals. I think it was in Kenya, it was mainly three large areas, um, huge areas like the size of Switzerland, you know, huge areas they set aside for the animals. And they told the native people that you can't kill the animals anymore. If you kill them, you're a poacher, you're a poacher. So gradually the whole situation uh, completely changed. So what had been completely natural before, suddenly the animals found themselves um, uh, having a limit, having a kind of limit and the native people who, of course, needed to kill, a few, to kill a few animals in order to live were now poachers. So if they killed an animal, uh, they were called poachers and they could, uh, of course, go to prison. So this was a completely man-made situation. And Peter was one of the first Western people who spoke very strongly against this situation because um, there was a terrible tragedy in one of these parks, one of these game parks, uh, where thousands and thousands of elephants were living. And the elephants were not allowed to move out of the park. They were constrained inside the park. There were too many elephants for the vegetation. And so over some years, the elephants basically ate everything and they created a desert. And of course, in, in the last period of when they were creating this desert, having you know, eaten all the forests and in the end they were, they were eating wood in order to survive. And the elephants were having heart attacks because what they were eating wasn't uh, suitable for them. And in the end, thousands and thousands of elephants just simply died. And Peter uh, went to this particular place and photographed the dead elephants. Um, in this book I just showed you, there are many pages showing these dead elephants just lying on the ground and rotting away, thousands and thousands of them. So an enormous scandal. And of course the government was very embarrassed. And so nobody was allowed to photograph these, these dead elephants, but Peter did it. And he published it in his book. He published uh, a wonderful book called The End of the Game, The End of the Game. And I'd like tonight to talk a bit more about Peter because um, he's published some wonderful books. He became quite an important artist, a, a great photographer. And after he'd um, developed his pictures, he would create montages and he would exhibit these in New York and in Europe, in London, in Paris. And he, in fact, became quite a well-known artist by the end of his life. And I would like to encourage everybody to look up on YouTube. There's a very good little film, about 20 minute film called Peter Beard, Peter Beard. And he says some very, very shocking things in this 20 minutes, which I think everybody really needs to hear. 
because what he was saying back in the 60s and the 70s, he was warning or trying to warn humanity that what he observed with those elephants, it seems that elephants are maybe the closest animals to human beings. They live in families, they have a kind of mummy elephant and other sister elephants looking after the baby elephants. And you know the daddy elephants kind of go off by themselves and uh, do, do their thing. So according to him, the, the social life of elephants is very similar to the social life of humans, even though, of course, we're always wanting to feel ourselves superior. But um, I don't know if any of you know this, but at the beginning of the 19th century, the 20th century, so in 1900, the population of planet Earth was 2 billion people. 2 billion people. And now, today, it's 8 billion people. 8 billion people. And they project that by 2100, 2100, they, they project that it will be 11 billion human beings, 11 billion human beings on this planet. And what Peter argued in his life was that the human, human beings are repeating exactly what happened that he observed happening with the elephants. And of course, in the last years, more and more, we are having to confront the fact that we are slowly, and even now not so slowly, destroying our planet. This millions of years of natural development on planet Earth has been or is being completely um, changed. So many uh, animals, many uh, birds, many insects are already become extinct. And um, these wonderful uh, game reserves that were set aside in Africa are now not much more than a kind of tourist zoo where hundreds of trucks take tourists around a predetermined route one by one, even traffic jams, you know, in the middle of these animal parks. And the animals, of course, are have become no more than a kind of token of their thousands of years of their history. And Peter was arguing through his artwork uh, and his speeches and so on. Uh, he was arguing that what he observed with these elephants, terrible tragedy, is basically what's happening with human beings. And as you may know, right now today in Egypt, there's the 26th meeting of the governments of the whole world, where they're discussing uh, what can be done to um, deal with climate change. Because increasingly, we have a situation where um, the ice is melting, the sea level is rising, and the oil and the um, combustion through cars and so on is basically putting into the atmosphere gases which are causing the heating up of the planet, right? So, I mean, we, we've all heard about it, but what he was illustrating from his experience in Kenya is that actually human beings, if they don't realize it, are basically destroying their planet in the same way those elephants destroyed themselves. And I mean, it's, it's a kind of sobering um, situation. And because I found this book uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was very touched from what he was arguing. I was very touched from the amazing photographs he took. He, he was a, a pretty amazing man. He uh, was extremely handsome and very well educated and very dynamic. 
uh, very unusual man who uh, later in his life, he met you know, many um, well-known artists and um, somehow managed to combine his natural feeling of spending time in Africa with the animals, um, with uh, living in New York and, uh, and so on. So I can strongly re recommend, if anything I'm saying to you about Peter Beard is touching you, start by looking at this 20 minute video on YouTube, Peter Beard. And um, if that continues to touch you, I recommend the book. Well, I recommend two books. One is called The End of the Game. So of course in English, game is what we call the animals, game. Because of course, in the old days, people would go and shoot them. And it was a kind of game, you can say, shooting the animals. So, but also uh, it's the end of the game is also suggesting that as human beings on this planet, we are also causing the possibility of the end of our game. Because fundamentally, we're not really different from the elephants. So of course, this is a little bit shocking, but if you, somebody who, who stays abreast of the news, you will know that since the last few years, they have these big international meetings and you know the, the important leaders from different countries all around the world, they go to this meeting and they promise all kinds of changes. And um, here I am living in Germany and of course, you only need to go a bit into the countryside in Germany, and there are windmills, thousands of windmills. So this is one kind of positive uh, change that we're using our technological understanding to generate our power. And therefore, we hope to use less coal, less gas, which are polluting uh, our environment. We're basically polluting our, our uh, whole environment. As you know, in the, in the Amazon in South America, I'm sure Cecilia will, will know this, that the trees in the Amazon are constantly under threat, burnt down, cut down. And, and uh, of course, the Amazon is one of the enormous lungs of the planet, lungs of the planet. So, of course, it's not so easy to see what I'm talking about. And therefore, I wanted to bring your attention tonight to this man, Peter Beard, because he was such a great photographer. And also, he made uh, incredible art pieces um, and I think when you when you see this and you, you you listen to what he says, it can be a little bit of a wake up. It was certainly a wake up for me, which is why I'm talking about him tonight. And um, the reason I'm talking about him tonight is that we, uh, a group of what about uh, I think tonight we're about thirty people. We are all making a decision, a kind of priority in our life that we don't want to just live with our eyes closed and our ears closed and be unconscious and to follow the mass of society. We are choosing or we have chosen that we are interested to become more conscious, more conscious human beings. And in my own personal case, you can see I'm very old now, I'll be uh, 78 in a couple of weeks, so I'm very, very old. But already when I was, uh, I can say 50 years ago, I made a kind of decision. I didn't really make it. I could say it happened to me, a kind of decision where I couldn't follow the uh, regular pattern of society life, even though at that time I was uh, 24 years old even though at that time I had rather a good job. I was living in the center of London in a comfortable apartment near a park. I had a nice little old Volkswagen. Occasionally I got myself a girlfriend, 
So I had a pretty reasonable lifestyle, but somehow there was a feeling inside, something is wrong, something is wrong. I couldn't really accept it. And this led me to an enormous journey, took me first to Japan, then it took me to India, and now I'm finding myself living in a spiritual community in Germany, the center of Europe. And um, since now 20 years, I'm very touched that we have a group of people living around John David, and together we are creating a kind of oasis, a kind of spiritual oasis. Many of you know this, many of you have been here, and for those of you who haven't been, uh, you're very welcome. So together as a community, or let's say as an ashram, uh, even a bit like a monastery, but more like an ashram, I think, than a monastery. Um, we are, we've created together a conscious community, conscious community. And of course, when you, when you become more conscious, when you delve inside, instead of always looking outside into the world, when you actually make that decision and you go inside, you discover an amazing world, actually, an amazing world which is there inside everybody. Everybody has the chance to come inside and discover their own being. And of course, our own being, our own essence as a human being is in fact, peace and love. So this is, uh, this is somehow what in the end, John David's life has, has developed or John David's destiny, I can say has developed. Now I'm very old, but um, I can see looking back on my life, that in a way I had no choice. And that's why I'm so touched by Peter Beard because for him also, when he was a young man coming to Kenya, he had no choice. He had gone out into the um, safaris. He, he traveled through Kenya on safaris, photographing the animals. Um, and he was so touched by the power of this nature and the diversity of the nature um, that he wanted to um, bring his um, experiences uh, back to a Western audience. And this is what he's actually done. And you'll find if you uh, go on to Amazon, you can find a number of books, beautiful books there, as, as you saw with this book, huge, huge volumes full of the most amazing uh, photographs. Here's a, I don't know if you can see this one. This is a, a nighttime of elephants. It's difficult on, on the Zoom, but maybe you can get a little small taste. <clears throat> Anyway, very unusual man, and he um, has reminded me, but probably he can remind all of us that um, it's very, very important to become conscious. The only thing that I can see is going to change the reality that we human beings are creating on this planet is that we become more conscious. And by becoming more conscious, we can't do a lot of the things that we're doing right now. Today, I was reading in um, a report from an African country. It's a fairly poor, primitive country next to South Africa. I think it's called Namibia. And in that country, they have an amazing nature where black rhinos and elephants uh, are living, and it's so beautiful that it's a World Heritage uh, protected site. But the government of that country has started to allow oil companies to come there and to 
investigate uh, if they would want to develop this land for extracting oil. You see. And this is, this is the incessant kind of demand that comes out of this enormous population. Yeah? So in 1900, there were 2 billion human beings. In Kenya in the 50s, there were 5 million people. And now, 70 years later, 54 million, 10 times more people in Kenya now than when he first came to Kenya. So one can understand the enormous pressure that all those people create into the natural environment. Anyway, so some of you may not want to hear what I've said, uh, but this is a call to become more conscious and to realize that um, in your life, you have to create some kind of priority. And of course, most of humanity, the priority is to make money, to get more, to get more material stuff. That's most people's priority. And um, that doesn't really work. Uh, I was reading today that, um, for example, if you take a typical middle-class American today, he uses three times the subsistent food level. So subsistent food level means three, he eats three times more food than you need for your basic uh, human life, yeah? three times more. And he uses 250 times uh, the subsistence level for clean water, 250 times. Right? So then they did an investigation, right? So they, they investigated how many people could this planet support at those levels. So if you took, if you wanted to raise up the quality of life of all the people who are now living on the edge of poverty, if you wanted to raise up the 11 billion people, uh, how, how many people could be, could this planet support at the same middle-class American level of, of living? And they came up with 2 million people, sorry, 2 billion people. 2 billion people, but we're going to have 11 billion people, right? So, I mean, I don't really know, but it seems to me that has a meaning. It means that there is some natural limit to the quality of life, because if in places like New York, in London, in Paris, people are living in a tremendous quality, it can only mean that billions of people in other parts of the planet are going to be living in poverty because there's simply not enough water, there's simply not enough food to actually support 11 billion people. Okay, so that's the end of my party political broadcast in, in favor of humanity. But this is not really about that, you know? It's really about our inner priority. We have some years to live, and what are we gonna do with these years when we're living, you know? Do we just want a bigger car? Do we just wanna have longer holidays? Do we wanna, what do we want? Do we wanna just get something, get something more? Or do we want to, develop our inner world in such a way that we can become more conscious. And through becoming more conscious, we can touch other people. And together, we can create some kind of um, understanding in the world. It was very interesting. Maybe you've come across, uh, there's a young Swedish schoolgirl forgotten her name, but anyway, she's become quite famous 
uh, because um, she speaks out very strongly in favor of the adults doing something for the children. Uh, now she herself is getting, I think, to 18, 19, 20, something like that. But she started already when she was maybe 15. And she's an unbelievably conscious human being, unbelievably conscious. And, um, you know, she attacks the politicians because she can see that they talk and talk and talk, but they're not really getting down to doing something not really getting it done, not really making the changes. Yes, of course, there are changes. We now have the possibility of a, an electric car. Uh, there are many, many beginnings, many beginnings. Uh, anyway, the other day she was invited to an English television program and they were interviewing her on this program. And she was explaining that when she was I think already 12 years old, she decided that there's not much you can do when you're 12 years old. So she decided she would do something with her parents. So she started a campaign in her own family. So for example, she'd go around and turn off the lights and so on. Small, very small gestures. Um, but anyway, um, of course, after some time, she had convinced her parents and then she was older and then somehow one thing led to another and she became a known uh, campaigner yeah, for climate change. Anyway, she was invited to this English program. Yeah? And apparently the people watching this program were sending... Um, I don't know exactly what they were sending, but one of these modern uh, techie things where you can send messages. And she was, they were saying, if you don't get that girl off, we will go off. We're going to turn off our television. We don't want to listen to her, you see. They don't want to listen even. Because what she's saying is touching something inside these people. They know that she's telling the truth, but it's such an uncomfortable truth. Maybe it means next year's holiday, you don't fly to somewhere uh, and lie on the beach. Maybe you stay home, you know? Maybe, it, maybe people are gonna have to do something to change the reality that human beings actually find themselves. And somehow Peter Beard, in some amazing way, touches something inside John David because it really wakes up the reality that human beings find themselves in, in, in this moment of our history. And of course, if we don't do something pretty drastically in the next 30, 40, 50 years, then it may be too late. It may have already got to a point where it's too late. Uh, some, some of the scientists are telling that it's already too late because that, of course, big companies uh, powerful countries like Russia, for example, uh, they are um, not really listening. They don't really want to change. I mean, the Russian economy is very much dependent on selling oil and gas. And uh, they don't want to change, of course. And um, there are other countries like China, a huge country where they've invested in coal power stations. And even though they're promising to plant many billions of trees in China, and even they're doing a lot with electric cars and so on and so on, still they rely on coal burning power stations. So of course, China is by far the biggest polluter of this planet. Sorry that I've gone on and on, but it seems to me that it comes back to each of us because it comes back to our own inner decision, our own inner priority that we want to wake up. We want to become conscious. So this is, this is my um, attempt tonight. And maybe somebody now would like to respond to me. If you'd like to respond, then 
wave your hand. Okay, Peter. Hello, hello. hello. <laughs> I, I'm so happy that you said that, that we should become consciousness. And your question was, um, what do you intend? What do you want to do with this years of living? Right. Right. And I had in my past 20, 30 years, a lot of very special experiences. And I tried to find someone who can tell me what happens with me. <laughs> And uh -huh. maybe you know this book here. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, right. I, I bought this book from your, um, uh, yeah, from I'm your from company. Yeah, yeah. And I'm only at the first 50 pages. You see, it's not so far. But right, um, right. I found some answers already inside. Right, right. It's the first book, and I read a lot of books in psychology and transpersonal um, psychology. And this is the first book who described that you can have a consciousness which goes to sleep and a second one who does not sleep. Right. And right. that's the answer I need. And this is the because I had these experiences. Right. And I want to get in touch with people who teach this, who can uh, who can go so deeply in the understanding of what we really are. Right. And this is right. the right journey. Uh, um, and thank you for for this <laughs> literature. I'm very right. pleased right. by it. And uh, well, thank I'm you very, very happy. much. I'm very happy that you've been touched from this book because yeah. as you, you've read in the beginning of the book, there's a kind of controversy because um, the manuscript was apparently written in the meetings of Ramana Maharshi by a young man. I would say rather, rather a special young man. And, um, but there's no really evidence, you know, there's no proof that what he wrote in his diary and what we have selected to publish in this book, there's no real proof. I mean, there is a small proof because we have some pages from his original diary written 86 years ago. So in 1936, he was a young man in his 20s mm -hmm. and he was completely touched from Ramana Maharshi. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, his parents brought him to the ashram and he wasn't interested, actually. And then when he came to the ashram, he met Ramana Maharshi and immediately something happened. Yeah. Um, Cecilia was talking about light, you know, and you're, you're suggesting you've also had some experiences. And he had a huge experience in these first moments of meeting Ramana Maharshi and he couldn't leave. So he stayed for six months and he'd been very well educated and he started to write the diary every day, which we've now selected from and published in this book. We have an intention to maybe publish more of this material because um, the people in the community Open Sky House, we have been, if you like, devotees of Ramana Maharshi for many, many years. So um, personally, um, I came in contact with him when I lived with Osho. I was uh, spending a number of years with Osho Rajneesh. And uh, one day I came across uh, Ramana Maharshi. And since that time, he became a kind of inner light, you could say, or inner guide, some, something like that. Because uh, after Osho died, I continued to live in the ashram for, I think, another year. And then I was taken to meet Papaji. And Papaji is a direct disciple of Ramana Maharshi. And he was teaching exactly what came from Ramana Maharshi. He, he would always say, 
I'm a kind of channel for Ramana Maharshi. So Papaji and Ramana Maharshi were very close. Uh, Papaji had spent a number of years living with Ramana Maharshi in the 1940s. And um, so anyway, I came, I came to Papaji and then later I became very much connected with Ramana Maharshi. So that now we are gonna have in January our 23rd retreat just down the road from Ramana Maharshi's ashram uh, in a small ashram. We've been renting regularly every January for 23 years. And this is a homage to Ramana Maharshi. So, I mean, if you would have time and interest, come and join us. It's always a wonderful experience. And uh, it seems that you've had a good effect on your son because he's also, it seems, interested in <laughs> the, same, the same stuff, you know? Yeah. So this is already, you're already um, kind of uh, showing what I was saying earlier, you know? I mean, you're obviously a completely unusual father who is not particularly teaching your son to becoming a racing driver or, or a tennis star or a footballer. Uh, and he's obviously already um, on an inner journey, you see? So this is already a gift that you've passed on to another human being, and he will pass it on later to other people. So this is a very simple but very important process, I think, how we can touch other people. It's like a giving back, you know? You've obviously had some very profound experiences, and you were deeply touched, and you shared this certainly with your son, but probably you've shared it with other people. And um, it's a kind of giving back for what, what you've also received. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and we, and we, um, I registered also for that um, guest week. So uh, we'll see us in two weeks. Oh, you're coming here? Yes, I come there. Oh, well, that's great. Good, yeah. Yeah, it's a very nice week. Uh, you meet the whole community, yeah. and um, yeah, I'm a little bit uh, disappointed. Let's say like that from Germany. Uh, what's happening here in this country? And I also are. I'm also interested in the community of Dania because I've been in Dania this year twice already. Ah. and with some registrations and so on, and uh, I'm looking to contact people and maybe to live a uh, more artak way of living that's what's going ahead now what's going on and on that's the right. process that's what i'm looking for right right well about five or six years ago we had rented a house in denia mm -hmm. um, do you know denia there's a place called la rotas la rotas it's this on the place, edge mm -hmm. it's on the edge of town Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of rather old community, mostly of holiday houses, so very, very quiet most of the year. And there's no road that goes through it. So it's oh, a kind of okay. uh, end of the road, you know, there's no, uh, you know, not a lot of traffic passing there. Uh, okay. And we were very lucky to find an amazing house with a huge garden. And uh, in fact, last year we bought this house. So now it's our own house and we have some handyman busy developing the, the property. Uh, so of course, welcome. I mean, come and come and visit us. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, I look forward to meeting you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> me <Great>. too. <laughs> we, it's a special thing to discuss, but then, uh, yeah, let's go to general topics. But that's yeah. the one thing because when you asked me, and this is the what that what me what what keeps me alive, not only alive, that is life. Yeah, that is my life. This is to to find out this who am I. That's the most deep question that points always in dual in, uh, in this non-duality and as such um a way that we can we can do that we can achieve that yeah and this is just like i compare that like in a car if you always use the front gears but never tried the back gear <laughs> and if you try the first time of your life you 
are mind blowing and say, what is that for a world? Right. And then you can read thoughts and look in future. And you see right. everything connected. Yeah. And it's not really complicated. No. The spiritual stuff is not really complicated because nature itself has given us this special inner world. You know, everybody, uh, when they arrive on this planet, comes with a full kit. You know, you come, you arrive with your being completely ready to be activated, you know? So we all have the potential, you know? We have the potential and we don't need to do anything about that potential, you know? When I was a young spiritual man in my 30s, I was searching for enlightenment, you know? I want to become enlightened. And now as an old guy with a white beard, I've come to understand I've always been enlightened, you know? You can't not be enlightened. It's like given, it's completely given to everyone. But unfortunately, hardly anybody ever really makes a connection to that part because we're always looking outside. We're always looking into what you could say is completely unimportant. And of course, we've been conditioned to look outside. We've been conditioned to become powerful or rich or materialistically, um, you know, whatever. So, so these conditionings are very, very difficult and they prevent us to really make contact to our own essence. And this is a sort of human tragedy, uh, but it's like that, you know. And so, I also think also the others, which we are, we are 27 here in the group, uh, they must also you must also have experiences in that uh, in that field in that matter otherwise you wouldn't sit here uh, and spend the time with that topic yeah right. and not right. watching netflix or whatever <laughs> just we want well, I, I mean, to you net, <laughs> netflix we've had our community now for about 20 years i think and in yeah. those 20 years no one resident ever said, I want to get a television. We yeah. never had a television in our community. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, I have to admit, I have a television because I have mm -hmm. two little girls who like watching cartoons and I like watching, you know, some English sports because I'm yeah. an English man living in Germany. So I, I need a little bit of English, uh, whatever. So um, I have a, a special football team I'm following through my television. You know? yeah. uh, but well, maybe I'm also curious about all the others here in the in the in the meeting. Uh, what's are their experience and and so maybe, maybe we can open that and right right and finish right. my okay. My comments and we look too. forward to seeing you in two weeks. That's that's wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So um, would somebody else like to? take what um, Peter was saying, would like to, in their own moment, share something on this subject. I, can, I won't mention their names, but there are two or three people tonight who recently completely forgot what they discovered some months ago and went from being uh, pretty conscious and having a high priority, they completely forgot. So I'm very happy uh, those three ladies are on the Zoom tonight, but I won't mention your name, but I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. And I hope that what Peter was just saying and what I've been saying uh, with Peter Beard, I hope this will remind you of an amazing possibility as a human being. We can become conscious and we can live in a conscious way. It requires a certain priority. That's all. We just need to make a priority. And this, of course, is not easy. Of course, I know it's not easy. These three or two of these three ladies were in my retreat in Spain two months ago. And at the end of the retreat, they were bursting with uh, priority, you can say. And now recently, uh, they both forgot, both forgot. 
anyway, I hope this meeting will um, reconnect you because this is the most beautiful possibility as a human being. So uh, somebody else like to share something on this topic? And I think what just happened with Peter and the book is also very, very touching, you see, because um, there's an enormous story about this book because, uh, well, it was a lot of work to do the book, to make the book, and we translated it into German, which is also a huge job. Um, and today I was um, connecting with some Indian people who are going to translate it into Tamil, which is the local language of Ramana Ashram and was um, Bhagwan's uh, language, Tamil. So I'm very keen to get this book translated into the local language. And uh, now I have two translators who are beginning to translate the book. So this is very touching. It may take some time because uh, um, we have a dealing with a different culture, basically. Here in, in the West, we, we have a sort of dynamic culture. And so the German translation, I think only took three months, but I can see that the Indian translation will probably take three years, but never mind. Okay, so I'm gonna ask Savita to share something because uh, she's a bit of a nature girl. Whenever she gets a chance, she escapes out of the community into the nature. So let if she was touched tonight by uh, what I was saying about Peter Beard. Hello, are you there? Yeah, hello, hello. Okay, so Savita is our newest resident. She's been living with us. No, Poker. Oh, Poker is, okay, you're right. <laughs> you're probably the youngest though, anyway, but. Go ahead, anyway. So what about this nature? You're the, a, a nature girl, yeah? Mm, yeah. I thought always when I go to, through the nature, then I feel much better and um, much more connected with myself. And then once you called me, um, we talked about this, and you remind me that I, I have to find the nature inside myself. And yeah, that was, that was a very important sentence for me, I guess, because today I was thinking sometimes um, about this. Um, and there are, were some moments in the car, so not in the nature, just sitting in the car there, um, I felt, Okay, here I there's there is the nature. I am I am enough. This is my nature. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah, I mean this is also what Peter Beard is pointing to, you see. He's pointing to the fact that the elephants are living in a kind of uh, family uh, social configuration. Uh, not so different from the way hu human beings organize themselves. You know? And um, so, you know, he, he was very much connected to the nature. He, he went out constantly into, uh, into Kenya, in different parts of Kenya. And um, I mean, you have to see this book. I mean, I, maybe I leave it outside to, tomorrow you can have a look at this book i've actually got in the last few days i've ordered about six books about peter beard because uh, he touched me so much yeah um so you can take this book tomorrow and see what happens to you because it's a kind of very powerful um and very different way you see i mean peter was just um showing us uh, this book aham sparana that we produced. This is Ramana Mahesh's deepest teachings. And so this is 
this is one way to allow your nature to get touched. And this book from Peter Beard, I mean, he wasn't really spiritual. I mean, he, I don't think he, uh, I mean, he, he's more likely to have gone to a discotheque and uh, then go to a spiritual meeting. So he wasn't, his lifestyle wasn't really uh, what you could call spiritual. But <clears throat> in another sense, it was quite clear that one of the most powerful elements of his life was living in what he called Hog Ranch, where actually there were some hogs living. He used to have some pet giraffes who he would feed in the evening. They'd come to his, uh, he, had a, he had for many years a kind of encampment. He didn't build a house. He had tents around a campfire. And because he was such an interesting man, the kind of philosophy people, maybe some of the politicians, and nature lovers in Kenya, they would come in the evenings and sit around his campfire and have a gin tonic together and discuss whatever, you know, the meaning of life. And um, so his approach was not what we would call a, a spiritual life. But when you come into this um, material, his artistic output, you can understand immediately that actually he, he was living a, a deeply spiritual life. Because, of course, you don't need to, um, how can I say, you don't need to follow a sort of spiritual philosophy to live a spiritual life, because a spiritual life is also just a natural life. But, and you, um, have, you have some kind of pull to this approach, I think. Yeah, but I had, now I have um, this question. So he he shows us um, very touching things, and um, but then we are um, on the outside. So and um, we we just looking um, what what has happened there, what is happening there. And um, today I was really looking inside. Um, yeah, what's happening inside myself. And um, then, yeah, I don't know what's, yeah, something I, I don't understand. Well, you're very lucky you don't understand because you're very young and you have many years to understand. And the journey to, to understanding um, is a wonderful journey. I think she's frozen. So um, let's see if anybody else wants to share. <clears throat> I think, unfortunately, in the community, we're all using the same internet. So it's not working so well tonight. Should we hear again from Panama, Cecilia? Would you like to share one of your um, insights? I mean, you, by the sound of it, you have many to share with me, and we'll do that in a special uh, meeting we can arrange. But if you'd like to share with the whole community, um, I'm sure everybody would be touched to hear from you. Um, my SP, uh, my SP, my SP, está el traductor, ¿no? Eh, sí, sí, sí. <laughs> ok, mi experiencia a lo largo de muchos años es, es como tú la estabas hablando, como usted la estaba hablando ahora. Es una cuestión de volverse conscientes y no importa en dónde estemos. Porque eh, este, este despertar lo lleva a uno solamente a concientizarse. A, a transformar la mente en, en una mente que, que es incluyente de la vida de, de los animales, de las personas, este, de, de nosotros mismos. Vale, para, para un poco porque se me... Ok. So my experience with... Uh, is, is exactly the same as you are telling. It doesn't depend on the place where you are. It's, it's bringing this to... Um, uh, this uh, awareness, this consciousness, 
to the place where you are. Uh -huh. En particularmente, yo he estado este, haciendo mucho trabajo de conocer la mente, de cómo funciona la mente, para poder este, descubrir lo que uno no es, más que descubrir lo que uno es. Porque lo que uno a, es... Yes. I have done a, a, my work is being discovering my mind, discovering what I am not. Porque, y poder transformar la mente, ¿no? Eh, a través de ese autoconocimiento. And being able to transform the mind through this knowledge. All right. All right. Y yeah, convirtiendo I mean... entonces. Eh, eh, dejar que entonces el ser verdadero eh, sea el que, el que actúe y ese es el que tiene una, una relación distinta con los animales que percibe la realidad como es que puede percibir eh, el amor puede percibir la, la, de, diferenciar ¿no? entre, el, entre la verdad y la mentira y, then, y es un trabajo de concientización then allowing the real, our real being, our real essence to act. And this, this real being is, uh, is the one who can see the, the reality, the animals and the nature. Yeah, and not, not only to see, you know, one, one of the things that's very beautiful with uh, Peter Uh, he had this land on the edge of uh, Nairobi, or kind of wild uh, nature, and he uh, didn't build a house. He, he lived in a, he, he, he made a tent, you know, tent, tents, kind of encampment of tents, as if he was deep in the nature, but he was just on the edge of the town. One of the things interesting about Peter is that he was in this en esta tierra, en la tierra de campaña, que estaba un poco al borde de, de la ciudad. And he called it Hog Ranch. Hog, H-O-G, Hog. Le llamó el rancho Hog. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had these amazing pigs, hogs, living with him. Tenía estos eh, cerdos increíbles viviendo con él. ¿Quién es? Creo que ha dicho cerdos increíbles. Ok. Yeah. And, um, for example, um, regularly giraffes would come to eat the same food as he was giving to the hogs. Wow. Y también las jirafas iban regularmente a comer de lo que le estaba dando a, a los otros animales. In fact, in, 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 on this YouTube film, if I remember, There is a moment when he's feeding giraffes. Y en el en el en la película de YouTube hay un momento en el que hay una sensación. So he was deeply connected to the nature. En la cual estaba muy profundamente conectado a la naturaleza. <clears throat> and um, yeah, this come, becomes very clear when you, you kind of get to know Peter through the film or through the books. Y esto se vuelve muy claro cuando conoces a Peter a través de sus películas, de sus vídeos o sus libros. <clears throat> I mean, just recently, I think in the last month, there's a book about Peter Beard's life has been published. Um, it's called Wild, Wild. Hay otro libro que se ha publicado recientemente que se llama Wild, salvaje, que es como que era un hombre salvaje. Yes. He was an enormously handsome, very handsome man. Um, era um, un hombre... Um, Muy buen eh, uh, Sí. Muy apuesto. And so... Apuesto. so So wherever he went in his life, he was surrounded by the most beautiful young women, Así que, fashion que models. Siempre estaba rodeado de mujeres muy hermosas, casi modelos. And he would take these young women out into the um, out into the countryside, and then he would photograph them with the wild animals. Así que enviaba a estas mujeres hermosas al campo y las fotografiaba con. Eh, 
animales salvajes. <laughs> anyway, so that, I mean, you can imagine maybe that that's part of the spice of his life, that he was definitely a ladies' man. Así que era un hombre de mujeriego. <laughs> <laughs> in, fact, in fact, he said one of his statements, one of his philosophy was something along the lines that the only true nature left is woman. El, su filosofía era que la última, la única eh, realidad eran las mujeres últimas. Um, anyway. <laughs> So if you're interested in uh, his life, his daily life, then uh, you can buy this book called Wild. It's available on Amazon, I think for mm -hmm. 15 euros. And um, it's a pretty amazing story. He was a very, very unusual man. Así que puedes conseguir por 15 euros este último libro de, llamado Wild, de este Muy... hombre. And you can feel how he was living in the moment. He was very present and very much in the moment. And he trusted life. Y puedes sentir como él vivía totalmente en el momento y confiaba en la vida. One little story. I remember he was with one of his young friends uh, in um, Copenhagen. Él estaba, una historia en que él estaba con uno de sus amigos jóvenes en Copenhague. They were flying to America, to, to New York. Ellos iban a volar a, o estaban volando a Nueva York. And at the airport, they were told that she would need a return ticket to come into America. Y en el aeropuerto le dijeron que tenían, necesitaban un, un billete de vuelta para poder llegar a Estados Unidos. And they were in the queue to buy a return ticket. Así que estaban en la cola para comprar el ticket de vuelta. But he didn't have the money. They didn't have the money to buy this ticket. Pero no tenían el dinero para comprar este billete. And suddenly, just behind them, y de repente, justo detrás de él, a man said, I'll buy your ticket. Un hombre dijo, yo compro tus billetes. You see. So this is a kind of practical living in the moment. Yes. Esto es una, vivir el momento de manera práctica. Yeah. And this is, of course, a wonderful way to live. Es una manera maravillosa de vivir. Yeah. No planning, no plans. Sin Spontaneous. Planear. In the moment. Spontaneo, en el momento. Being present. Trusting existence. Mm -hmm. Confiando la existencia. Estando presente. Okay, so I think uh, I think we'll uh, say good night to Cecilia and everybody else. And um, I'm very happy that uh, we can start these meetings again. So next week the meeting is on Tuesday. La semana que viene la reunión será el martes. And um, I would like to remind you that. Uh, on the 28th of November until the 7th, uh, the 4th of December, we have this Volunteers Week where you can come to the community for free and spend a whole week with the community. And I'm happy that Peter, Peter will be there. And uh, we have this retreat coming up in India. It starts on the 8th of January until the 29th of January. Okay, okay. So I say good night. Thank you. See you on Tuesday.